Hey everyone, this is Jason again. In this video, I'm going to show you how I built a Kulva, my eight and a half foot tall Torin Death Knight, from beginning to end, so you can see what's involved and why it took over 700 hours. I'll first go over how I built the main body, then go back and talk in more detail about the hands, head, mace, and sword. Gathering some of the materials together started with a football helmet to build the head around. The hard plastic is good to mount hardware to. An aluminum backpack frame is used to build the upper body around, and aluminum drywall stilts give me the height and stability for the weight and bulk of the costume. I discard the bag part of the backpack and take photos that will be used to making scale plans of the suit. This gives me an idea for the shape and size of the separate parts. Erasing the background in an art program allows me to make sketches that I will use to make measurements. Putting all reference in an old frame keeps them clean out of the way and I'll keep track of my hours on it. I start by finding the final height of the stilts and cut them up and remove any extra weight and unneeded parts. I use an aluminum MIG welder with an argon gas for the aluminum welds on the project. Here I weld the stilts back together to reduce the squeaks on the joints. An old pair of my work shoes are permanently fixed to the stilts with steel wire through the sole. The laces are knotted and cut where I can slip them off easily. Wiring the shoes on like this is extremely lightweight and has zero impact on comfort. I use the straps from an old set of ski boots to replace the uncomfortable stock drywall stilt straps. I drill out the rivets in the boots and remove the strap unit. Adding more padding for comfort, I adjust them where I need them and bolt them onto the stilts. Now the core of the legs are ready for wire. A different view of the modified stilts. I started with a 50-foot bundle of aluminum service wire, which had two 4 aught and one 2 aught strands. The 4 aught strands were too thick to use with 19 individual strands inside, so I unraveled them into a 9 and 10 strand bundle. Then, chucking them up into a heavy half-inch drill, I tightened the bundles to take out any bends and kinks. This also compresses the individual strands together to make them easier to weld. I temporarily removed the straps for welding and start adding support tubes to the backpack made out of aluminum. This first ring is the collar of the suit around the neck. Here I'm making sure that it's in the correct spot. Adding the lowest waist ring and chest center line. And then two rings on the sides are the base of the arms. And I make the arms big enough to pull my arms in and out while in the suit to perform various tasks while inside. I like using this wire for making the costumes because it welds easily and takes any form you need to make. I make two welds per intersection of wire and make them on the outside to avoid making any rough spots on the inside. The internal structure is the same as a wireframe model from computer animation modeling. I make a mesh using squares that are around 4 to 5 inches. My first test fit. Notice my arms come out at the armpit of the Minotaur which will give the illusion of long giant arms after its shoulders are built up. I leave plenty of room in the back where I will mount some of the electronics. The wires are left long at the base until I know how the legs fit. The silhouette of the leg is chalked on the floor for a guide to shape the wires. Wires are sized and the first ring is welded on. Here's the outline of the leg and I'm able to weld the wire right to the stilt. Starting out with a few loops makes it easy to fill in the shape later. In the background, you can see the aluminum spool welder I'm using. Here's the outline taking shape, and I wanted to make the dog-legged shape of the leg while keeping my leg in a straight, comfortable position. The leg next to the chest to get an idea of scale, and when the suit is done, it will be about 8.5 feet tall. And by the time the suit is done, I will have used about 400 feet of wire. Remember that most of that was split in half, so it took about 70 feet of bundled wire to make. Here I use the first leg as a guide to cut wire so the second leg is the correct size and shape. I had to tape a shield over the shoe because molten aluminum was melting holes in the inside of the shoe. The space in front of where my shin will be is where I will store things including the 12 volt battery which weighs about 5 pounds. This way the stilt is carrying the weight and will only affect me when I lift that leg to walk. Now this is my third Minotaur costume and after five other homemade stilt designs just go out and buying a set of drywall stilts is definitely the way to go. The second Minotaur costume had a separate upper and lower leg which looked odd when it walked because each piece would twist opposite the other. 
This suit will have a pivot point at the Minotaur's knee, which will look more natural, and that's the aluminum tube you see. Now both the upper and lower part of the legs are open in the back, so they're easier to put on. And here's a test fit of the legs before the upper thighs were built, and here's a completed upper body. I decided the upper body didn't go high enough, so I added more wiring to create more of a head or a back hump that Torrens have. The downside to this was there was not enough room for the helmet anymore, so I decided to change the head design. By adding the black supports you see, I could instead use these to mount the head so I didn't have to wear any headgear at all. For the arms, I took long pieces of wire and spooled them up like a huge slinky and mounted that to the body. Duct tape kept the rings flexible, but limited the distance the coils could stretch. This allows the arms to flex in any direction and keep their shape. Here I made a custom duct tape exhaust port for the hot side of the air conditioning unit mounted in the back. A couple of parachute cord loops allow me a solid spot to lift the body or hang it for display. Now onto the hooves, which were about 20 inches in diameter and are built the same way as the body was. I stripped down a Class D amplifier which will be mounted in the chest and an 8 inch subwoofer in a custom sealed tube that is mounted in the leg of the large cavity in front of my shin. This is the PicoTalk that takes my voice input and controls a servo that will make the jaw move. I screwed all of the circuitry onto a plastic plate that gets installed inside the chest wall. I use one inch upholstery foam for the next layer over the wireframe of the body and legs. I push zip ties through the foam with surgical clamps and around the frame to attach them. In areas where I need definition in the body, I take an aluminum wire and strap that down which compresses the foam along that line here and here. The foam gives shape to the wireframe and also a great surface for gluing the fur to. I make sure to keep the upper and lower legs separate so the knee can bend. Here's what it looks like from the inside as I try to zip tie at each intersection. Here are some out of order photos, but they give you an idea of how the suit will fit. I actually like how not wearing a helmet pushed the head forward so he will appear more hunched over. Okay, back to foaming the arms. Foam strips just on the coils helps to keep the mobility so the arms don't bind up. Once the foam is on, I use a spray adhesive on both the foam and the fur to adhere the fur to the body. Velcro strips down the back of the legs will allow me to get in and out. I tied off the arms to keep them straight as I glued the fur around them and continued on to the main body. I left out the thinner fur where the thicker fur would go and left open the exhaust port for the air conditioning unit you can see there. I glued the thicker fur on in the same way and I really like the way the fur feels with the foam under it. It feels like an eight foot stuffed animal and here's what it looks like with the fur on. Now that the fur is done, I moved on to the armor, which is made of PVA foam. The foam is cut and heated to the shape I need and then glued directly onto the fur or other foam pieces using contact cement. The first step of the shoulders was a foam piece glued onto the fur, followed by discs that would give the shoulders their size. Plates were glued onto the discs, then the lower half of the shoulder was attached. Detail work was added to the foam armor cut from sheets of hobby craft foam, and pipe insulation was cut lengthwise and used as edging detail on the shoulders. Next, the painting begins. I chose my color palette and started masking off the fur. I used Plasti Dip as the primer coat over the PVA foam, and then a deep metallic blue over that. While keeping the plastic on, I started to airbrush the color. Some areas were sponge painted with scrap bits of the upholstery foam. Once the base coats were done, I went in and added some ice crystal looking detail with the airbrush. The hooves were wrapped in one inch foam and a thick coat of house primer was painted directly onto that. Base coats of color were added next until the look I wanted was complete. The belt was cut from one long piece of foam and some details were glued onto that including some plastic Halloween skulls that were hot glued on. The belt was painted the same way as the armor. Lastly, a rather temporary loincloth of sorts was cut from a couple different fabrics, sewed together, and hand stitched under the belt to complete the look. 
Okay, that was the quick general walkthrough on how the body was built, but let's go back and talk about the head, hands, and weapons in more detail. I wanted the fingers functional on the costume, but I didn't want them to just curl up, so I tested some functions with Legos. I came up with a design where the whole finger moved when closing and not just a segment at a time. I moved onto strips of wood to mock up the function of the finger in two dimensions. I worked out the pivot points on the knuckles and the pivots points on the internal moving parts. The actual fingers are made up from two inch ABS plumbing pipe. Here is one finger segment. To work smoothly, some of the plastic needs to be ground down. A sanding drum on a Dremel works pretty good for this. Here, one finger made up of straight sections and couplers cut in half. A finger section being joined to the palm and the internal components that cause the finger to close more naturally. The internals will run the length of the finger. The finger curled up, but I decided to change the length of a couple of the finger segments and starting to mass produce finger segments at a better looking length. Notice the ground down edges needed to make the joints move properly. I used a heat gun to close the tips of each finger. I also used 16 penny nails as the pins for each joint. And starting to assemble the palm, you can see a fist starting to form. And in hindsight, I should have angled the thumb up a little bit more. The wrist is made of four inch ABS, and this is what I will slide my hand into. Here are the tendons running through to the tip of the finger made from bike brake cables secured with strapping tape. Like the rest of the body, I wrap one inch foam around each finger to give it some size, but I need to take care not to hinder the curling of each finger by cutting out football shaped holes. Once I give the hand its shape with one inch foam, I cover the gaps and holes with quarter inch foam glued on with spray adhesive. And this is the layer I will cover with latex. Once the hands are covered with foam, I take a four inch block of upholstery foam and carve out some hybrid hoof fingernails. I hollow them out and then glue them onto the tip of each finger. Now I use liquid latex to give the feel of skin after it cures and it takes about five to six coats to fill in all the little holes from the foam and to get the right thickness. I color liquid latex with acrylic paint and do the same five to six coats on the hoof tips. I then airbrush some color onto the latex and coat the hands with baby powder to get rid of that tackiness left by the latex. I then use spray adhesive to glue the fur onto the back of the hand, folding under the edges that meet the latex. Now I am ready for the hand armor, which uses the same PVA foam as the shoulders. I cut and form the pieces with the heat gun. I make each finger segment separate and do not connect them so all the fingers function and won't bind up. Taking a Dremel with a sanding barrel tip, I add some battle scars and smooth out the edges. While test fitting the pieces, I decided they needed some intricate detail. So I used my soldering iron to melt grooves in the foam around the edges for detail. Taking contact cement, I apply a fair amount directly to the fur and then onto the back of the foam. This method works surprisingly well. Again, I take care to make sure that all the fingers still move like they should. Once the glue is set up, I mask off the latex and fur and spray the Plasti Dip as a primer. Then my deep blue metallic and airbrush the detail. And here's the final product. Now on to the head. The head starts out much the same as the body but I integrate two inch ABS plastic to be the mount for the authentic bull horns. I then cut aluminum pieces to create the roof of the mouth and functioning lower jaw. And for the eyes, I use, yep, you guessed it, Christmas tree ornaments. Because they are plastic, spherical, one is slightly smaller than the other, and they have a little protrusion for the hanging hook. I use the smaller sphere as the eye and half of the larger sphere for both the upper and lower lids. A threaded rod through all of the hook hanging protrusions allows me to position the spheres exactly where I need them. For the teeth, I used a rigid insulation from a hardware store because it's extremely light, shapeable, and paintable. I shape the teeth how I want them and then put a layer of duct tape around the aluminum jaws to give something for the hot glue to stick to. I prep the eyes for paint using a base coat of primer, then a color coat, then for the gloss shine, I use a two-part crystal resin as a top coat. 
For the eye and jaw movement, I salvaged servos from my old RC car and mounted them both in the head, one for the eyes and one for the jaw. Then I added an Arduino and some LEDs to the horns and eyes and wired it all up. Here's what it looks like without the fur. This time I used half inch foam under the fur to keep it soft and made sure not to restrict the movement of the jaw. The tongue is simply a blue foam camping mat that has a great natural gloss and texture. More half inch foam and fur completes the back half of the head. Then I cut several strips of hair from a Halloween wig and hot glue that around the jaw to cover up the area under the jaw where I see out of when I'm in the suit. Now onto the mace. The cool thing about the mace is it's not really a prop weapon. It's a sitting stool for me when I'm tired in this 125 pound suit that is disguised to look like a mace. I first took a heavy aluminum pipe, riveted a thick plastic circle onto it, and modified a two gallon bucket for the head. I took some LEDs and wired them into the foam that laminates the bucket and ran the wires down the pipe to a battery pack at the base of the handle. I cut the fins out of more PVA foam, doubled them up, and glued them to the head of the mace. Thin craft foam adds detail to the fins, and after gluing them on, I sanded down the edges and smashed the fins with a chained steel rod to simulate damage. Strips of foam are weaved down the handle to simulate a leather grip. Here's the finished handle. The mace is primed with a plastic dip and painted like the other armor, and here is the finished sitting stool. Now I don't have a lot of photos for the sword, but it's pretty straightforward. There's an aluminum shaft that runs down the entire length of the sword embedded within the two layers of rigid foam. The rigid foam is great because it's light and you can sand it with 200 grit before you paint it, but it is hard to cut. So I made a hot wire cutter with wire from an old hair dryer. A DC charger will heat the nichrome wire to cut the foam. Once I cut out the general shape of the sword, I can go back with the heated wire and to start shaving down the thickness of the foam. When I'm done cutting with the wire, I start shaping the foam with a wood rasp, then a file, then sand with 200 grit sandpaper. I add a couple of skulls with hot glue and a four inch pool noodle for the grip. I prime the foam with house primer, then paint along with some airbrush detail. When it's done, this seven foot long sword only weighs three pounds. Hey, so that was the video on how I built a Kulba. And if you have any other questions, let me know down in the comments section. But since those photos were taken, I have built him a chest piece. I have LEDs and these little silicone icicles for him. And I wanted to show you how I built these, this rib cage. The rib cage is built out of this pipe insulation, which is foam. And then when you take a heat gun to it, you can reduce it in size, it shrinks down, and you can form it and shape it however you need. So let's take a closer look real quick. I'm going to lift up his hair and you can kind of see what the chest looks like.